Hi guys, it's Blackie and my good friend Grouch McGowan. And we're going to be talking a little bit again and just let y'all sit in on the conversation. Well, brother, it is finally fall in lower Alabama. We are still getting days in the 80s. We've had a couple of cool nights. Yes, we have. The other night at the, the gathering uh, at Geneva State Forest, it was 39 one morning, which was hoorah. Most time it was like mid 40s at night. Uh, one night it was like 52. Perfect sleeping weather. You enjoy a fire. We had good dry firewood. We'd sit up talking till 11 or 12. It was a full moon. I couldn't mm -hmm. pick anything better. Just a lucky shot because I had to pick my date six months out. And it was a full moon, clear skies, no rain, um, no hard wind or anything like that and good cool temps and then plenty of firewood so great time well it happens you used to put on an event on your land and uh i remember we used to do one in, in the winter down there frozen I, foot yeah. frozen foot i tell i told the story at camp several times about the night we were all sitting down there and that big semicircle, and we wasn't paying attention to squire and he was running in and fight, throwing wood on the fire and he threw them two fat lighter stumps on there. And suddenly we had 12 foot of fire going up. Oh yeah. Everybody had to run for the creek to get water to try to put the fire down. Or we were going to have a crown fire up there. Oh boy, loved him to death. But it he... was also the night in February. Yeah. I was laying in my tent. It was probably in the 20s. 2 o'clock in the morning and we heard Grouch! Grouch! And I thought, what does that old man want? Yeah. Grouch! I've fallen crapper and can't get out. Yeah. And I thought, oh no. <laughs> he had gone into the outhouse. It was a home-built outhouse. It was sitting on the board and the board broke. And he didn't fall in, but he fell down. It put his butt down in a hole in his Arms Nick, and legs straight up. Arms and legs straight up, and he's trying to get a hold of something to get out. He didn't fall all the way in, but he fell down in there. So. Oh, he got covered. He was, he was bottom having, wash, yeah. He had to go he right. get in the, yeah. the creek that night, we, about 20 degrees. We got up and went out there and pulled him out, and he went down there and had to wash. But, you know, every time in February, because Don Davis came up for years, I mean, came down for years later. Yeah. And he and I always went down, and, and you did it one time. Yeah, several times. We went down to the creek, and we took a bath in the creek in February. And, of yep. course, that was 30 and 40 years ago when the temperatures were still lower than they are now. Oh, yeah. Because I have pictures from then. And in February and in March, every year at, uh, at Dogwood Hollow, where the cabin is, it snowed. Yeah. And uh, I have pictures of uh, light snow, not even an inch. Good still, dusting. Yeah. It snowed. And uh, of course, one time it snowed uh, almost two feet there. And I uh, got great pictures of it. I mean, Man loved the canoe during the snow. I remember that. I yeah. used to have all them pictures up in the cabin of you wearing your capote and Ann wearing hers, and y'all went. Everybody else is, you know, panicking because it's snowing and y'all decided to go and canoe. Yeah. And uh, had coffee going, had the coffee pot going in the canoe. Yeah. And Sam sitting up front, riding along, and the dogs. Oh, right. and dogs. the dogs. And, and several of us towed along, and we stopped on a big sandbar, and I broke out my orange pack basket. Yeah. And made doolally biscuits, kanaka sausage. Yeah. And, uh, and bacon, and of course coffee, and hot water for tea with honey. You used to sing on on cold mornings. Yeah. For like Reveille, we were all working in them days, you know. And the way he'd wake up to camp was he would sing this song, and I could hear part of it. It was a uh, fresh air and sunshine. Oh, it's good okay. for me, you know. This one. is an old Alabama song that I learned when I was in school in first, second, or third grade, okay. when schools used to teach music to kids. Right. Okay. And that is 80 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, I 
want to wake up in the morning where the mountain, no, where the pine trees grow, where the sun comes up even though where I'm sleeping, and the songbirds say, hello! I want, <laughs> I like the fresh air and, and the sunshine. sunshine. It's good for us, you know. So I make my home in Alabama where the pine, pine trees grow. He would beller that <laughs> at the top of his lungs, and that was revelry. That means get your butt up, coffee and biscuits are going. Get oh, up. yeah, because every morning I had those. Uh, I had three Dutch ovens, and I'd make those great big round dew lolly biscuits. Yeah. And then uh, poke a hole in them and fill them with honey and chopped nuts. Yeah. And then that big coffee pot I had, and anybody that came by, and you know, to tell you how cold it got at that time. Now, I'm not exaggerating because you remember that. I remember. My dish pan from the night before where we washed mm -hmm. dishes, it would freeze over and everybody got a dram of scotch. Yeah. And they'd put your glasses down on top of the scotch and fill them up, I mean on top of the dishwater. Yeah, on the ice. On the ice and fill them up and everybody would come by and drink a little dram of scotch and then go over to get a do lolly biscuit, mm -hmm. some sausage, bacon, and coffee or tea, whichever they It was for medicinal first. purposes. You just swished it around in your mouth as a mouthwash, right. killed and any bad bacteria. That's right, but you swallowed it so you wouldn't kill anything on the ground. Right. I yep. remember that. Yeah, yeah. I remember when we were at uh, you camp up there at uh, Fort Toulouse. Remember we had that little pond up there and we were sitting oh, yeah, there yeah. and it was 6 10 in the morning and we were cooking breakfast and determining what we we're going to be doing that day and somebody brought out that about that much in the bottom of a fifth of whiskey and passed it around everybody just took a swig and swish 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 to clean their mouth is what they were doing right yeah. and we passed the bottle and somebody walking by going to the bathroom saw that and the, the legend went around camp that we drank a fifth of scotch before we got up in the morning Right. Oh boy. Well, in one way, we didn't drink a lot, but we nipped a lot. Yeah. Because when we were down in Florida one time, and they they were going to pay us whatever we drank to yeah. run the camps, the safety, yeah, uh, to keep the outhouses clean, the water, and all, I mean the food, uh, yeah. food brought in for sale, and firewood. And they came down on the third day and said, we got to renew, renegotiate, because yeah. we cannot afford y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and we had brought our own to drink, too. Yeah. 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 But we, we really didn't. We very seldom, except on our big party night. We did not drink to excess. Right. It we, was just a little we, nip here and nip there. Yeah, because we were responsible, safety-wise, for everybody there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was good times. I remember the shining time, the December morning where you got up to, to shave and the dang phone froze on your face. Oh yeah, we had a, a cold wind right. blowing. It was probably in the teens. Yeah, and he went to shave and he's gonna shave with a straight razor and he lathers up and he picked up his razor and he went to do that and it had stuck. It, it froze. The phone had froze. Right that cold wind froze it. Yeah, it made me think I was back in. Some of the other places I had been yeah. in the fast, that, that fast where you could throw a cup of coffee up in the air and it explode. The difference in the hot and the cold. It just Well, you spent some time in the Arctic doing the Marine Corps yeah. training mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I was up in Bodo, Norway for, for uh, a bit. My son Steve, uh, when he was in the Marines, uh, went up there for Bodo for a while up in the Arctic Circle. And of course, I was in a lot of de different deserts and jungle, and I did tundras in different places. Fifty-one countries all together I played in mm -hmm. uh, over the years. And like you say, it's shiny times, good memories. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit okay. this time is shooting. Okay. Okay. Within our group, within any group, that's that's devoted to outdoors, outdoors activity. Yeah. You have 
two distinct groups. Mm -hmm. You have people who go shooting, mm -hmm. and you have shooters. Mm -hmm. Blackie, you're going to have to get up and I'll just get the mail. I'll be right back. Well. I can call. Don't worry. Right. I have an ability. Well, anyway, while Blackie's gone, we're, we're going to talk about, to me, and I probably should look at the camera more, I apologize for that, but I'm going to tell you, my eyes automatically go to the outdoors. I've spent most of my life outdoor and being confined to the house now for because of physical disability, and it is physical. I'm in perfect health. I'm just hurt. There we go. My, my eyes automatically go outdoors. Mm -hmm. So anyway, talking about shooters. Right. You have people who are shooters, and you have people who do shooting. Mm -hmm. Two distinct groups. In my group, we not only knew about the brass system, breathe, relax, aim, slack, squeeze. Right. Every time we picked up a weapon, uh, a long gun or the short gun, we automatically did it and made it the best shot we knew how. We never slacked off mm -hmm. because the way you practice is what you're going to do when you got to go for record. Exactly, yeah. And that was the difference. And later on, when I, I picked up the guns and I was learning to shoot from the hip, I had met Elmer Keith. And for you people out there to know who Elmer Keith is, some of you got to be old. Yeah. But he and Jack O'Connor wrote the books on good shooting and good hunting. Elmer Keith was a pistol man. Mm -hmm. And when we met Elmer Keith, I was shooting the pistol for the Marine Corps. And he told us to learn to shoot from the hip, get you a six foot high, 12 inch wide board, mm -hmm. stand it up, and shoot from the hip, aiming to hit the board from the hip. And when you could shoot six times and hit that board all six, take that board and turn it sideways, mm -hmm. and when you could hit that board six times, all six, Anytime you fired from then on, your shot would be within a 12 inch square. One way or another is in the 12 inch. And then do it with a 6. Well, mm -hmm. later on I bought a set of pistols that are actually like, alike, and I would walk through the woods and I'd say to myself, pine cone. Mm -hmm. It'd be 20 feet away, and I'd shoot from the hip with the right hand, and if I didn't hit it, I made it jump. Mm -hmm. Or the left hand, mm -hmm. and that's thousands of rounds being shot, mm -hmm. but that's paying attention to detail, mm -hmm. every single shot. And that's the difference. I see these guys with magnums. Mm -hmm. The last time I shot quail, I call them birds. Mm -hmm. All of us did, birds of partridge. Right. I was using a double 16 Fox Sterling work, which I still have. Right now it's hitting a hundred years old. Mm -hmm. And this was about eight, nine years ago. Over a four day period up at my boy Brian's plantation, we shot birds mm -hmm. and I shot 125 times and I had 123 birds. Now, I missed more than two times, but having shot as many birds as I did, several times when the birds lined up just right, I would take two down with one shot. Mm -hmm. One time I know I missed, just as I was getting ready to kill the birds as the dogs had flushed, one of the dogs jumped up in the air after the bird and I shoved my gun straight up in the air because I was already pulling the trigger. Yep. Or I would have shot a dog. You hit the dog. That's yep. right. Oh. And we were raised, that dog is more valuable than a car. And well, these dogs were. These oh, yeah. dogs sold for some time. You know, uh, Brian's Culls, because he's won national championship mm -hmm. three times, Brian's Culls are outstanding dogs, but they're not competition dogs. Mm -hmm. And they go to these big plantations for 5000 up a piece. Mm -hmm. And know? that's the cull. And that's his Culls. 
mm -hmm. uh, because they're number one dogs. Mm -hmm. And there are people that come from all over the country to go to Brian Peterson. Mm -hmm. he, he just grew up here mm -hmm. and uh, and buy dogs from him because mm -hmm. they're, they're getting a great dog. But anyway, I had some people walk over and say, what what kind of shells are you shooting? Mm -hmm. And I reached in there and they looked and they said, you're shooting low brass, which was called a, a field load. Right. You're shooting skeet mainly. Yeah. And they all were amazed. And I said, no, what you have to do is put the shot where the bird is going to be when it gets there. Yes. And most of you guys think the shot goes out like that. And it doesn't. Mm -mm. Anytime you're going to pat on your gun and you put your newspaper up and you put a bird in the center of it or mm -hmm. a squirrel, whatever, and draw your 36 inch circle, you swing that gun and shoot and carry your swing all the way through. And when you go down, your shot pattern will look like this. Mm -hmm. Now count the mm -hmm. pellets within that. Because you're, you're not shooting, shooting dead on. That's right. You're not, and even if you're shooting dead on, the shot in the back of the shell is not going to get there at the same time mm -hmm. as the shot in the, the front. The string's shell. different. Right. When I went for national camp, because I grew up like you, now I was never a wing shooter. I was the guy you want for rabbit, squirrel, small game, deer. Yeah, I, that's me. Mm -hmm. But I was never the bird. There were other members of the family that were the bird hunters. Now my mm -hmm. granddaddy, my uncle, they were bird hunters. I just never had the eye for it. But I went to National Camp School to learn to be a shooting force director for Boy Scouts. And the only way I passed the dang shotgun skeet side was, and I had two national champions was teaching us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got up by us and we were using pump uh, Mossbergs in 12 mm -hmm. gauge. And I said, can I dry fire it? And when I call pull, I'll shuck it mm -hmm. and go for it. And she said, well, why do you want to do that? I said, just please let me try it this way, because I was struggling. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to have 10 birds in a row or else. I wasn't going to grab I was acing everything except mm -hmm. that. And so we got up there, and I dry fired on Nick Chamberlain, and it went click, and then I hollered pull, and I brought it from the wrist position, mm -hmm. snap came up, and I did my 10, because we grew up in the field with something jumped right, under right. your feet, and... Mm -hmm. Sitting there holding the gun like they wanted you to, ready like a professional skeet. I had mm -hmm. never done any of that, but snap, bring it up. I was good at that. I could do ten, but well, I shot skeet for Marine Corps. Oh yeah. But when I would practice to go hunting, mm -hmm. I always came from the hip. Yeah, because you're carrying it down here right. with pops. I always did, and uh, the, in fact, the only time you really could mount if you wanted to is if you're shooting cartridge and the dogs are pointing and you're easing forward and I wouldn't do that because there's briars, there's plum thickets, there's roots and there you are with the gun there and your finger on the trigger. That, that's not safe at all. Yeah. Yeah, and you shoot somebody's dog in the south and... Uh, oh God. Oh uh, yeah, it's, it's in trouble. But anyway, going back to shooting, when I was shooting the rifle and I had some of the best coaches in the nation I shot with Eric England, national champion. I shot with Dumpy Bartlett. I shot with Matthews, Goldwyn. These guys were legends. And I shot with Army shooters. I shot with the famous Barbara Howell, the, the Army whack that just, mm -hmm. she would embarrass Marines, soldiers, and sailors too. Anyway, we learned, we shot iron sights, mm -hmm. 200, 300, 600 and a thousand mm -hmm. iron sights. You had to look at your sights, you had to be able to look at the wind, and you had to do everything right every time. Mm -hmm. When I shot what was called the Marine, War, Marine Corps match, which was 600 yards, for the Inner Service Championship, I placed 51st because they only uh, picked the 60 best shooters for placement because mm -hmm. it was the 600 best military shooters in the nation, 10%. Mm -hmm. I had a perfect score. Mm -hmm. Guys with a perfect score did not place. Mm -hmm. They had to measure each shot from center of bullseye to determine. 
Well, it wasn't long after Dumpy Bartlett was shooting the thousand. And somebody run it. Well, of course, Dumpy shot his 20 rounds. They were all mm -hmm. bulls. And at that time for that, you kept shooting as long as you hit a bull for... You could stack it up. Right, you stack it. And, uh, and, and uh, Dumpy still holds a record. Uh, I think he was enlisted in. He retired at war officer. But anyway, they started running for the truck, which was over a mile away on a range, to get more ammunition because Dumpy didn't have that much. And he went 90-something rounds perfect and ran out of ammunition. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever done that since then. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you. 90 something rounds at a thousand yards with changing wind and iron sights. Sight, sun Which, changing, everything. Right. So it goes back to my point. There are shooters and people who shoot. I, Jack O'Connor, mm -hmm. killed every big game on the North American continent and hunted other places and used a 30 out 6 or a 270 mm -hmm. and a four power weaver scope when he did use a scope in the mountains. Mm -hmm. You don't need a magnum if you can shoot. Bingo. This isn't water buff. Mm -hmm. Well, that's most of them today. They can't shoot. They don't put the time in. They, they want shock power. I have seen this many times. A guy, you know, I used to build guns. And there'll be guys that will put $1,000 in a rifle, $500 in a scope, and then go out and shoot it 12 times before opening day. Yeah. You know, at best. And none of them that, I asked them, they said, well, they were going to handle us, you on a chronograph? No. And mm -hmm. how do you know what the velocity is? Yeah. Oh, it says here on the box. That's right. a test barrel, that's not yours. And so they can't shoot, they can't stay focused. How many times have you and I been sitting down there and heard somebody shoot three and four times and we know they're trying to hit a deer? Right. Mm -hmm. You can hear that rifle crack off. Oh yeah, we could tell if they hit a deer or not sitting around the fire. Yeah, we'd hear bang, 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 bang. Yeah, yeah. he missed. Right, yeah, he might have wounded it. He just chased it But you it know, down. when we would get through shooting during the day, our practice, and that afternoon, people think, well, shooting, that's a good way to make a living in the military. Mm -hmm. That's a hard way to make a living. That afternoon, we went and we snapped in. Mm -hmm. And you would take nine and a half pounds. Mm -hmm. It's summertime, July in the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. You're wearing two sh sweatshirts and a canvas shooting jacket. Roll that rifle in your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Drop the left hand and hold it with the right hand mm -hmm. for a minute. Mm -hmm. Then after you did that 22 times, you sit down and rest 15 or 20 minutes, and you do it like this, and you would snap a shot 20 times, and you made every snapping shot as real and as perfect as you could, and if it didn't look perfect, you took it down. Yeah. And that is, is like chopping firewood, like going to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're shooting because you enjoy hunting and all in today's climate, the expense, game management, conservation, you owe it to the game yes. to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. When I would pick up my little 36 caliber flintlock mm -hmm. and go squirrel hunting, I had one shot. Mm -hmm. It had to be a head or upper shoulder shot. Right. Most of the time, 50, 60 yards. Mm -hmm. Three squirrels would do it. You come back, quarter them. You're going to eat them tomorrow because you're going to put them in the water and vinegar. You so grind them overnight, take that taste out of right. the acorns. And then the next day, you quarter them up and you got rice and wild, little wild onion in it and, and your thick gravy. Uh, or else you, if you'd gone partridge hunting, you got those quail and you take them and uh, baste them in a, in a good sauce that you make and uh -huh. wrap a strip, strip of thick 
Canadian bacon around it mm. with a lot of fat on it mm. and then stick them in your Dutch oven and, and uh, then put them on a bed of wild rice and that was shining time. You remember you and I, I came over and we went squirrel hunting and then we went back to the cabin, we're doing that, you're brining it. Mm -hmm. That night is when the other members were coming in. Mm -hmm. And remember Teddykins? Yeah, yeah. And we were down there at the fire and you cooked squirrel and rice like you're talking about, a few little wild onions and stuff like that in mm -hmm. it. And he had sat down and you and I had started eating and he said what it is. And he said, there's plenty of pot hit itself. And he had ate, oh, five, six minutes talking about this is really good and everything. And he thought it was pork or something. Mm -hmm. And then you told him it was squirrel, and he just about turned green. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Oh, it was good until 30 seconds ago. In our house, we, I had a really good friend of mine from here in town. We played football and all together. Good boy. And uh, whenever he came to our house, mother always invited him for supper, mm -hmm. Roger. And Roger learned that for the first time or two, he never asked, what we were eating, because yep. we, we shot a lot of wild game until after the meal. And and he enjoyed it, you know, he said, but if he thought about it, the time he ate alligator, we had alligator, mm -hmm. uh, real white flesh, and he thought it was some kind of a bird from out west. Kind or of whatever. chicken or something. Yeah, uh, but uh, that's so true that, that people who did that, those days are gone. Well, even store-bought stuff. You and I, back when we we would do these events down at his place, mm -hmm. and, and the rendezvous, you, you, people, every one of us was good cooks. And we would have big meals on a given night, like mm -hmm. on Tuesday night would be our big dress meal or whatever, mm -hmm. and everybody would cook specialties. We've seen an entire turkey cooked on the spit oh, out yeah. there. Jeff, uh, little Jeff made sushi one year, remember that? Oh, remember when we took the, the deer quarter and uh, put it on the ground. Yep. Uh, and, and it never made the table. It never made the, the table. It just would flake off and just. Yeah. Oh. That was that. I donated that and got it. I donated because mm -hmm. I had to come back and they cooked and it never made it to the table. Yeah. Everybody ate every bit of it. It was just 60 some pounds of deer there. meat. You know, you didn't have to even cut it or anything. Yep. Oh, but yeah. We used to get tripe. Remember? Oh, right. You cut it in small pieces. Right, I cut it in small pieces. I introduced Hope to that yeah. at one of the events down there, and I said, it's beef. And she said, okay. She doesn't like tongue, so she's scared you're going to get her tongue. So no, I'd warn you if it's tongue. And it's a texture thing to her. Yeah. And I said, you cut it in real small pieces, and then you deep fry it. You, you, you batter it a little bit, you salt and pepper, and you deep fry it, and you make dipping sauces to do mm -hmm. it. And we did a, uh, uh, I invited employees that worked for me over to the house for a Super Bowl one year. And mm -hmm. I'm in the kitchen, I'm cooking all this stuff, and I bring out these big old bowls, and all, they're all sitting there watching the game. Those little squares of meat. Little old squares of meat, and then like 15 or 20 different different sauces. Oh, and, yeah. And they you were just tell them it's cow stomach. I just said it's cow. <laughs> I just said it's cow. And finally one of them, you know, said, uh, what is this? I said, it's beef. She said, yeah, but what kind of beef? And that's when the little lady that worked with me slapped her on my arm and said, shut up, I don't want to know, it's good. Yeah. Well, you know, you try it. I used to cut it up, and I did introduce some of the guys to it. And when I cook it, I take a pair of scissors mm -hmm. or shears and cut it up in squares and put it in a bag. And when we canoe, you take one or two pieces like chewing tobacco Stick. and put it in there and chew it for half an hour and get all the flavor out. And then you had the option of swallowing it. Or if you wanted to, throw it over the side for the turtles. It made you good know? bait too. Yeah, because it stick together. It tough. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it uh, cow stomach is like plywood. Mm. A layer of muscles, a layer of muscles, a layer of muscles, mm -hmm. a layer of muscles. So, yeah, it uh, it wasn't something that you were going to chew. Up. I tell you what, it reminds me of. One year when we were trapping, mm -hmm. we. We prided ourselves on eating mm -hmm. as much as we could. We were going to try to eat a bobcat, three of us. My brother Jack, myself, mm -hmm. and one of my sons, Daniel. We barbecued part of that bobcat. We bought pot boiled part of it. We fried it, 
and even the dogs will need it. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, yeah. I recommend unless you're starving, do not, you know, sit down for a big plate of, of bobcat. No, it's just too Just tough. sell the hide and let it go. You could, it, you can never get it to tender up or nothing. I, I've heard that. I remember family mm -hmm. members, they were in Korea, and they uh, found dead house cat that was fresh killed. Artillery barrage or something. So they snuck that sucker back, you know, figured, we'll, fresh meat, we'll cook it. No. Nope. They figured out real quick, you, right. you can't eat cat. Oh, you know, that was, you know, it came out not long ago. It's, uh, somebody said people up north were eating dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew it was a lie because ain't nobody eating no damn cat. They'll eat dog, but they ain't eating cat. That's right. Well, I've eaten dog. Oh, dogs yeah, I've eaten dog. Yeah, puppy. There used to but, be a uh, Korean restaurant yeah. over in town that, right. that they did mm -hmm. kagogi. I don't know where they got the dog from, right. but they did kagogi. But you, uh, you know, if you kick around the world enough, you're going to eat a lot of things. There's a lot of different meats I like. When I was in Africa, I never cared about shooting a lion or, mm -hmm. or a, a elephant or mm -hmm. even a water buff. If I'd have wanted to shoot something, it'd probably been the challenge of a water buff. But then what are you going to do with it? He's too damn tough to eat, and I don't collect horns. Out of all, everything I've ever killed, I kept hides. Mm -hmm. They're on chairs and right. make stuff out of. But there's only one set of horns in this house, and that's because they were so perfect. Yeah, that and, rack. Right, it was a perfect rack. I've killed deer with a lot more points. Never bothered to have them mounted. But this one was, everybody that's seen them has said, God, they're just almost perfectly mm -hmm. symmetrical. So, uh, well, what's one animal that, if you were, could step back into your 30s and back into your hunting? What's one animal you always wanted to hunt and you never got a chance to? Anything on the planet. Right. All right. To challenge myself, mm -hmm. I would have liked to have gone for a grand slam in mountain. Mm -hmm. Go. Because you have to climb. Yes. You have to fight that weather. You have to shoot across valleys and read wind, go in two different directions at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it just the sheer challenge of doing everything right. Mm -hmm. You know? I hear you. Now, I shot one time, shot birds, driven birds, and, uh, 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 Great Britain mm -hmm. did not like it. To me, it was a slaughter. Right. Somebody handed me a gun and me just shooting, shooting, bang, bang. I totally did not care for it. Mm -hmm. I also went on a stalk. Now, I didn't shoot, but I got to go and see, and I liked that. I liked how hard we had to work in that terrain mm -hmm. for the guy to, to get that shot, mm -hmm. you know. Now, you know, at one time I used to uh, wear an old Irish walking hat, I remember and that. I had those badges around it, yeah. and it was different things I had shot and what have you, and clubs I belonged to, and I had wild boar, I had uh, uh, one of the deer from mm -hmm. from Europe, I had uh, different type birds, mm -hmm. and these things were on this uh, uh, green background and they're silver or pewter mm -hmm. and then of course I had a uh, uh, salmon mm -hmm. uh, that I'd caught and I was proud of those because to do that I had to go through school and prove in Europe that I could meet their standards mm -hmm. to do it and so I took those badges but I didn't care a thing about uh, the horns or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I understand the, the uh, driven bird shoots. What they do with those birds is you may kill a thousand birds that day. You'll have a hundred shooters out there. Mm -hmm. You paid to shoot. You get 10 or 12 birds to go home with mm -hmm. and you paid a lot of money. Oh, to I shoot. bet. And you had to put on shooting clothes too. Mm -hmm. You must that's, be properly dressed. Oh, you, yeah, that's another $1,500. Anyway, they take all of these birds and then they use them through the year uh, because they have to make money 
to keep these huge estates up yeah. unless you're born with lots and lots and even more lots of money you can't can't do that yeah. and uh, uh, I don't have a lot of money and that of course I never wanted to do it anyway but uh, well, it's like a lot of the African tribes that are selling hunts they're not doing it out of desperation they manage this herd and they realize that this old Cape Buffalo has got past his prime He's become a danger. He, he's becoming a problem. He's already reproduced. It's time to harvest him. Well, they'll put out a thing and yep. get, a, get somebody to come in. They're going to take him in there. He wants horns. He's going to do the dangerous job of taking him. He gets his big hunt, and then that whole village gets all that meat because you ain't coming out with right. all that meat. No. You're going to get well, a meal out of him. You're going to get a horn. You know, that really came out of the uh, worldwide, no, the... Uh, World Wildlife Fund. Yeah. Yeah. And what they did is they went over there and they talked to these people that instead of going out there and using modern weapons, which all of them can get, and killing all the game around them, yeah. that if they help the game wardens protect the game, mm -hmm. that number one, and they do this, that when these tourists come in to take pictures of safaris, they get a part of that money. Yes. When a hunt group comes in and they establish this range they can hunt on and off, they get a part of that money mm -hmm. and it's a crop. Yeah. They're harvesting a crop. Right. And it's good. It, it's kept a lot of game land uh, in Africa, game land. Mm -hmm. It's kept a lot of animals there that would be extinct by now. And it's kept a population healthy. Mm -hmm. Good. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw mm -hmm. a documentary where they were looking at and this big old pride of lions. There's actually three prides in that particular area and they know every animal. Of course. They got it named. And uh, they were pointing out the one, I want to say his name was, was Virgo. And uh, he was the, the big head honcho, had been for about 12, 14 years. There were two other young males coming up fighting him for control mm -hmm. of the pride. He was about to be losing his crown and so they had announced that like the next year they'd be doing a hunt because when they're drive, driven out from the pride they can't hunt for themselves that's when they go after cattle and stuff. Well it, it, that's part of it. Another thing is the lioness does the hunting. She does the hunting. Right. His job is is to make babies. And enforcement. <laughs> and you know, be the yeah. one to attack the jackals and stuff. Right. Yeah. He was past his prime and he was getting to the age and fighting one of the young ones, he got a little bit scarred up on his face. And so they had uh, the whole village had come together and talked about it and you know they they got a sheet up and they put up a picture of him. Everybody knows him on site, mm -hmm. you know. And they said, We're thinking about next year uh, letting him be harvested and everybody raise your hand if you're in favor of it and they said yes. And so they, the guy that was coming in to actually hunt was from Germany, and he was paying several thousand dollars, several several thousand, thousand dollars to come in, and it was showing that that money was already earmarked in this village. Their share was for education, uh, a new water well that they mm -hmm. needed, and some uh, some more medical supplies for a little clinic they had, mm -hmm. and then uh, came in. He had three or four days of really good time they fed him took care of him took him out there of course they know exactly where the line is but instead of just taking him straight to it they took a couple of days to kind of give him a little hint of it got him to shoot to make sure he could shoot and uh, then they took him out there and he got his big chance he took the line and then he had pictures with the line mm -hmm. and then they brought him back and of course they professionally skinned it the hide was then turned into a trophy for him and that mm -hmm. was going to be money the meat, they, the biologist got two samples and meat samples and some other thing and that's mm -hmm. for they're doing research mm -hmm. on the health of the animals and there's just like 20 or 30 separate things that all yeah. lined up for this one animal who already lived a full and healthy life and he has a choice now they're trying to drive him out he's going to starve to death yeah. Or he's going to become a nuisance going for people or cattle because he can't take anything else. Or the jackals or, or the jackals dogs are going to pull him down. So it, it was a merciful end to him, you know. 
and uh, it was they were working around. They said about every two years, they would be something in the three prides that needed yeah. help. They had a female that she had got wounded and was meaner than hell in the beginning of attack cattle. So they sold her to get rid of her. I don't, you know, I, I believe in hunting. I believe in the idea. Oh, I do too. I, be, I believe. Uh, I'm glad you said that because we're talking about conservation. Yeah. The Pittman Robinson Act. Listen up, people. Most of you never heard of it. Mm -hmm. The sportsmen of the United States voted, got their their legislators and congressmen to vote a tax on themselves. Mm -hmm. Every gun, every rod and reel, every lure. Every shell that is sold comes under the Pitt Robertson Act, and that money goes for conservation. That's you bird it. watchers, you would not have the birds if it were not for the hunters of the and fishermen of the United States. And That's who's paying for it? They they're the ones who started the conservation, kept it going, and that goes into my number thought on that. My heroes. Mm -hmm. Uh, my, of course, I got military heroes, people I fought with, mm -hmm. and, uh, people I admire a lot and all, but, but my personal heroes happened to be five leaders in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. One of them, a Republican, mm -hmm. against all odds, started the National Forest, mm -hmm. the National Parks, National Wildlife Refuge, both <clears throat> broke up the big trust, had the highest decoration in America for bravery, the Medal of Honor, mm -hmm. had the highest decoration in the world for peace, the Nobel Prize for Peace. Mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Okay. One of my heroes, self-educated man, made the decision that ended World War II without an additional United States casualties of one million, because mm -hmm. that's what they had predicted yep. and were making Purple Hearts for. Mm -hmm. Helped start the United Nations, gave the United Nations teeth and career, kept Berlin from going communist under Russia with the Berlin airlift, mm -hmm kept the other part of Europe from going communist with a Marshall Plan. Uh, the teeth and career. Great decision after great decision. And that was Harry Truman, the Democrat. Was Harry Truman. I mean, it balanced out to me. And of course, my others are Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. He created the ABCs, which was the National Recovery Act. Civilian mm -hmm. Conservation Corps, mm -hmm. uh, all of those that that put actual cash money in the poorest people's hands and uh, got us through the Great Depression and ready for World War II. And of course, Lincoln and Washington. Mm -hmm. Lincoln was aware, I mean, Washington was aware and said so, and I, once I read it, I never forgot it. What the British do not realize is I can afford to go on losing longer than they can afford to go on winning. And he just did his plans where he won enough battles to keep the one-third of colonials who would fight fighting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we became a nation. And, of course, Lincoln, against all odds, uh, kept this nation together because if we'd split, we would never be what we are now. So, mm -hmm. so my politics have really never been a particular party, a person in a particular party. Mm -hmm. I, I, I belong to a party because I believe in ideals. But my politics, because of that and because of my heroes, has always been the individual who runs and what he has already given to this country, mm -hmm. or she, mm -hmm. and what I think they can continue to give. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. not 
uh, uh, my sons, who happened to belong to a different party, one of them, was amazed to find out that I belonged to two different libraries and was a plank owner in the other party. I said, I believed in these people. Mm -hmm. I saw what they did for this country, mm -hmm. and I honor them. And he well, now, just totally shocked it that I that, did that. That was in Alabama, the way we grew up. Mm -hmm. It was individual. Yeah, we weren't party. You know, yeah, well, we didn't have two parties. Nobody so cared know. about a party. It yeah. was who the person was, and if you 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 try to nail them down one way or the other, but if my case like that, my family was a lot like that. Mm -hmm. I never heard what party it was, yeah. it was who the individual was oh, we yeah. were talking about. And it, we were kind of, everybody was independent. It was who's the guy. It, it, they really were. For one thing, I remember after Big World Jim War Fox. II, oh yeah, uh, Big Jim. Uh, uh, Kissing Jim. Kissing Jim. Yeah. And, oh, uh, only Alabama could have him. I don't know. Huey Long was a close in somebody else. Yeah, they there. shot him down. They, they got him. him they didn't shoot kiss there, there was a lot of yeah. individuals. Over and he the was years. called big because he was about six five, six six. He's a big man. His cabin is over there at Elba, right beside the jail. He built, he paved the country roads, not the, the main highways. Yeah. He said he was going to get the farmers to market on rainy days. He found out. What a legend, uh, you know. He found out that there was a federal fund for each state for emergencies, and that the governor could declare an emergency. And he did. And he declared an emergency. It was something like too many possums were being run over or something. <laughs> and once he got a hold of the funds, he immediately threw them out to pave the county roads where they could take them back from him. And it, oh, contracts already gone, it's been paid for, and everything. We got to right. protect the possums. Yeah. There's over possums. But really, he was taking that money to pay the county roads and get farmers to market. So well, I remember my granddaddy talking about him. You know, he, of course, I grew up a different time. But now I got I, before we get off on that. Hold on a minute. There's something I want to talk about. We could back to that sure. guy hunting and etc. Uh, down here in our neck of the woods, yeah. in our life, uh, years longer than mine, we've watched the deer herd come back. That's right. We've watched the alligator come back. We've watched. When we were boys. We were whale with, are coming back. Whale to are coming. Extent. Yeah. yeah. The armadillos showed up in the eighties. There wasn't armadillos here when I was mm -hmm. young. Maybe mm -hmm. in your day, not mine. The wolf has come back now. The coyote mm -hmm. and, the, and the wolves are now here. I'm hoping to live long enough because they turned loose elk in Kentucky, and they got them yeah. into Tennessee. I want to live long enough to see them things move into Alabama. Wouldn't that be something? You know Alabama had a wolf. Yeah, the Alabama had a, red. That's right, the Alabama red wolf. Yeah. And uh, it tall legs. But, but to uh, see that, I, I belong to to the uh, wolf people in America, out of Minnesota, mm -hmm. that do most of the research and what have you, have for years, mm -hmm. and funded my own wolf for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I have a paw print downstairs and a mm -hmm. certificate and all of that. But, uh, uh, and, and that's the way I am uh, about life is mm -hmm. uh, try to put back more than you took out, no matter mm -hmm. what. And I do that with a lot of things. And I think because of it, I built up a fairly decent reputation that where my family will not have to be at shant ever ashamed of saying, mm -hmm. you know, we we uh, came from that family. Well, you remember back toward then whenever it got where we weren't canoeing together as much. Yeah. That time that you, me, and Larry floated down and that whole flock of wood ducks. Oh, yeah. Stayed just, that was, oh, we I saw the baby ducks. raccoons that day. They were in that tree mm -hmm. right over Larry. The baby otter and the mama, the, that, there was probably 30 of them wood ducks. And they, would, they were on that creek, Pigeon and Creek. And we saw one other thing that day. Great blue hair and what else? Okay. Yeah, that great blue I one. saw it and I thought it was a water moccasin doing this. Yeah. So I motioned y'all to come up and y'all had, well, we, you already knew, but Larry had to be taught not to talk in the woods. We talked to each other. We got right next and whispered. Mm -hmm. It was a turkey. In the water, swimming all the way down, killing the lice, the mites on it, 
Mm -hmm. The only thing up was his head, and we got there and we watched it walk up a, a first bank, wings dragging on the sandbar, and then hop up two or three feet to the second wash, mm -hmm. and then walk off in the woods that way. The only time I have ever seen a turkey kill mites that way, but I see birds in my bird bath mm -hmm. do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, we got we well, just did not fly and you know, he could have just flew across. He chose to get in the water. Oh, he's walking around. Like he said, and walking around in a circle, he's drowning the mites that are on him. Yeah. By sticking yeah. just his head up out of the water. Yeah, and he I thought really it was a thought moccasin it was head. A water moccasin doing this. Yeah. Coming through the water and I was gonna use a machete on him. All them big old turtles. Oh yeah. We'd be real quiet. Soft shell turtles. And you'd come around and be on the end of a log and he'd be sitting there asleep and Grouch would reach over and tap him on the top of the yeah. shell yeah. and wake him up and you know, yeah. dive in. Well that'd be that'd be up around eleven o'clock when the sun was hot. Yeah. To get in that sun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had that little bitty spit kit, which was only like an eleven foot long canoe. It's a pack canoe. And he had this great big old fiberglass cargo canoe. And he's just going 16 like sixteen foot. Sixteen foot. He just one stroke, bring it up. One stroke. I'm playing Hawaii Five O back here <laughs> as fast as I can go. Keep up with him. He just got stroke. He had such mass and momentum. He just kept going. Well, so you he, got to remember, I canoed the boundary waters. Yeah. I canoed down through Central and South America. Mm -hmm. I canoed a lot in Africa. I found out which end is a paddle to put in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It made a difference. Once, it did. Once you turned it over. Yes, it does. Which way it turned? And poling. Yeah. Oh, I love to pole. Stand up in the canoe and pole. We had that 12, 15 foot pole, that piece of rubber on the end of the pipe. Right. So it wouldn't sink in the mud. And you just go poling up with what it is. You'd get in, stand up in the canoe. Spread your legs out and you're going to use your feet to move the canoe yeah, and hold on the pole. Mm -hmm. So you bring the pole up and you stick it on the bottom and you walk down the pole. That's how you propel yourself. And you go upstream. So you go upstream as just far as... Up just stream. flying upstream. And you go as far yeah. as you wanted to go up there. Then you found a place to pull off on the sandbar and you put all that down. You take out his fly rod. Start working with fly rod and float back. See? So you didn't need a motor, didn't need a truck to carry around there. You just go up and you yeah. float back. Oh yeah, yeah. going up the yeah. waterfall. Up but up. you know, I, I was thinking about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. I really was because uh, I'd gone out of Central America one time. We were going to hunt Cubans that were coming in to blow up the canal, and we got them. But when we got there, they had these instructors come mm -hmm. out to, you know sort of get us in time and in tune with the jungle we're going in and they had these dugouts and they're about this wide mm -hmm. and they said a white man can't use this i got in that thing and stopped around you know i didn't try to say it stood up and i turned around and told him you evidently have never seen a boy from south alabama south mississippi or south louisiana we call them Heroes. <laughs> Heroes. Yeah. We grow up shooting standing up out of boats like this. Yes. Because we don't shoot ducks sitting down. Mm -hmm. We stand up and uh, if you're going to spend a 10 cent at that time, 10 cents on a shotgun shell to shoot, daddy expects you to bring something home. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but that but, we even, when we were boys, you still had stories about those old guys who'd been cavalry guys. Oh, and my grandfather was first Alabama cavalry. With cavalry, yeah. and they'd turn loose the dogs running deer and yeah. be on horseback staying with the dogs. Oh, yeah. And shoot them with a pistol, mm -hmm. you know, because they'd been cavalry officers that'd been trained to be at a dead gallop and be taking out things with pistols. And so the hunters would get in the big thing and they'd turn loose the dogs and the the dog handlers are riding horses to stay with the dogs. Oh yeah, to drive. To mm -hmm. drive, you know, and if a deer popped up where they could get it, they'd ride up and shoot him with the gun. And that you think, oh, that's terrible. You ain't that took just a lot to of skill. You're holding on with your legs. Yeah. Yeah. You you got to have good legs. That's why so many of them were bow legged. 
Yeah. Is over the years your muscles and bone took that set. The reins are in your teeth. Mm -hmm. The brush is just slapping the fool out of you. And you reach back and pull out that carbine mm -hmm. or a pistol, cock it with one hand, mm -hmm. and then ride up behind the side the animal and shoot him. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's that tale on the Alabama River where uh, they had, uh, a couple of them had ridden down to the river mm -hmm. and rode across at a shallower place mm -hmm. about waist deep on a, war, on a horse. Mm -hmm. And then one came riding through boogity boogity and just saw the tracks and he rode his horse off in there and realized it was a deep place and was pulling out his carbine and went off yeah. and hit the horse's withers and it jumped to the middle of the river. Yeah. And when he came out on the other side, the ice forming on him and the old man broke out the filth of whiskey and threw the top away. Yeah. Took a swallow and hanging him bottom and said, here son, you need to, you need this more than we do and you sure know how to make a horse take the water. Yeah, <laughs> okay. he was mad at that horse because it had shied away. He'd bring right. his gun up and the horse didn't want him to shoot and he shied away. So he was bearing down on deer and the, the horse was getting and he got mad at it. And so when he rode up there and he saw him, he gored it like crazy and went charging that dang water and he was going to grab that gun oh, out. Man. And just as he got it right there back, the thing went off and bang and that was it. The horse went vertical. Came out right in the middle of the river for 20 feet deep. <laughs> By loose. Horse from oh, high. Yeah. Down. When oh. he got out on the other side and stood there three minutes, I started for many a time. In fact, you and I and the captain, the keeper of the spoon, I talked to him not long ago. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, the keeper of the spoon and several others. We were in North Carolina when they first moved the southeastern rendezvous up there. I remember. We were in the mountains. Our tents were set up at an angle like this. Had to put firewood up under the front of the car and you were on a slot. And tie the bed to a tree outside to, to mm -hmm. stay in it. And we were sitting there and it was raining and they had rotten firewood. It didn't even make smoke. Yeah. And everybody was watching icicles form off her hat as the water ran off and the captain says, Rouch, are we having fun yet? And I said, Captain, I don't think so. And the next yeah. morning, Alabama was on its way back to Alabama. And we packed up. That was right. after that. And, but I will say this, they learned a lesson. And next year they had decent firewood. Yes. And the mountains were still steep, but they didn't have as steep a part. Yeah. Yeah, they, they learned it that uh, just like it was 200 years ago, if I wasn't comfortable, I'm going to go some other place. I remember Oak Mountain for frozen foot, and you had to get out to take a whiz. And when you went to get, I did that a lot. Yeah, but when you went to get back in that sleeping bag, Uncle Dog was in the foot. That's that right. He was a snarling and snapping. <laughs> right. You were arguing with, damn it, it's me. You had to take the sleeping bag and shake him out. It was a dachshund. He got all the way to the foot. He was warm. You're going to put them cold feet on me? Uh-uh. Yeah, but Uncle Dog went to war with me. Yeah. For real. Yeah. He had uh, two parachute jumps. Yeah. No, three jumps. Been in a submarine twice. Been aboard ship with me. Yeah. So he, he'd been around. But I remember another time at Oak Mountain. Myself and Swamp Owl, mm -hmm. uh, Brian uh, Lassiter, mm -hmm. Swamp Owl, were, had thrown up a little lane to next to the creek. Mm -hmm. And I had gone off and left everything but one blanket. Mm -hmm. I didn't even have a capote. Mm -hmm. I never did that again. It's funny how you will really learn. It really motivates you. Yes, sir. Some of that in the mountains in January, uh, six degrees. It was the lowest six that night and 20 mile wind. I had taken a couple of big rocks, put them in the fire, mm -hmm. then I had put them in a hole that I dug and covered them with a little dirt, mm -hmm. and put one at my feet, 
and I laid on it and slept. And you thought that was neat as hell. Yep, you made a hot bed. That's right. So you went and got yourself a rock. Yep. You went up beside the mountain to your, your camp. Up on a ledge up there. And you put your rock in the fire. And then that night, you wrapped some material around it. Yep. Put it in the bottom of your sleeping bag. And Swamp Al and I are sitting down there at the fire drinking a little coffee, trying to stay warm, smoking our pipes. Mm -hmm. And we hear, FIRE! FIRE! And we look up, and you're coming down the mountain, because you done set the foot of your sleeping bag on, on fire, and that zipper and was jammed zipper up. Stuck, and you couldn't get out, and, and you were hopping like a one-legged bunny rabbit, coming down going, bah, bah, bah. And you went right in the creek, shee, yep. and sizzle, and Swamp said, not enough dirt, seen it right off the bat. Yep, and now I'm trapped underwater in a sleeping bag. And we oh, did get you out. Oh, after I, when I stood up, you know. There wasn't no sense in us getting ice on us. I, I it was only a couple of feet to the, the bottom. bottom. finally gave, and I pulled that entire sleeping bag out. I went out of the foot. When I broke surface gasping for air and everything, they were standing there. He had a mug of coffee going, hey, you okay? Like, Got you up there, built the fire yep. up, dried your wet butt off, yep. put our only blanket around you, yep. and filled you full of coffee and let you whiz in the creek all night. Yep, warm back up. Yep, yep, yep. You know, my camp was But gone. you were sitting there naked because I didn't have any clothes to give you. I didn't have any clothes to give me. At all. In fact, I was wearing a shirt and then a leather jacket, mm -hmm. green jacket, and a breech cloth and moccasin. That was That's it. all I had, and it was yep. and my blanket. Six degrees. Yep. And uh, yeah, I never made that mistake again. <laughs> hey, two or three years later, we were at an event that was a Scottish event, and we were sitting. On the deck out there, I remember that. And that at the cool, lines in the mobile. And that cool breeze was coming across. Yes, it was. And that. And I was wearing kilts. Whoever that dude was, he was somebody in the state government. You knew who he was. And he walked up, was talking, and he said, You know, ain't you guys cold sitting out here? And uh, I looked at you, and he said, Oh, it's a lot warmer here than it was in a creek with, yeah. a, with a hot rock. Tell yeah. him the story, Blackie. Yeah, he was a deputy sheriff from Mobile County. Yeah. And later on, we were partying at that place a year or so later. Yeah. And uh, the neighbors uh, called the sheriff's department, not the manager, and said a bunch of druggies were out there raising hell and dancing outside around the fire wearing skirts. Yeah. And he came out there and he happened to be one of the bagpipers from Mobile. Yeah. And knew me and several yeah. of y'all because you had met. And uh, just went back and told them, just bear with them. Uh, they'll wind down about two to four in the yeah. morning. Because they got a parade to go to and everything. Yeah. But yeah, uh, but I remember that night very well. Uh, I also remember being at the Lions Inn, mm -hmm. and we're getting ready for a formal party, and we're putting on our kilts and our formal jackets with the doodahs and right. the medals and all all over. Right. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, I hear from next door because the walls were made of uh, tissue paper. Well, actually, I, I, I think it was this sticky back paper. Yeah. <laughs> I heard Larry, old fuzzy butt, say, I forgot my kilt. <laughs> yeah. So he came running next door, and I said, Larry, being we're only going to a formal affair, this is the only time I've never brought more than one kilt. Yeah. So he, uh, I told him, I said, Blackie came down wearing a military set of clothing, and tonight he's going to put on his kilt and a military jacket. Yeah. Go borrow the military trousers and wear your kilt jacket with it. Because right. he had it. And nobody knew the difference. Yeah, he could have banged on yeah. my door. <laughs> I remember. And I opened the door and he says, I need your pants. And I'm, okay, so I just shut my pants off and hand them to him. Go ahead. You know, because Hope's in the uh, bathroom getting ready, and she said, Larry forgot his kilt. 
He's running the grouches. You hear him go across. <laughs> He ain't got a kilt. He's saying, go get your pants. I'm like, what? He's saying, say, go get your pants. I opened the door. I already had to know he knew it. And of course, he had to And he said, because all of us could hear, I want your pants. Take them off. And you took them off in the doorway and gave him a hot pants. I have. Let me tell you another time like that, you'll remember. Mm -hmm. We were in Panama City. We were going to a Cayley that night, which is Scottish for one hell of a party. Right. Yeah. And, uh, we were, y'all were going to come by because uh, it opened at, at 1800, 6 o'clock, and get Ann and I. Mm -hmm. And I told Ann, I said, they're going to be early again tonight. They're always early, and we're trying to get dressed. Mm -hmm. I said, but I'm going to educate them tonight. You're already left. I remember. You and the mud track. Me and mud pounded track. upon my hatch at a quarter till. Quarter till. I open the door and I'm standing there to start butt naked. I said, how dare you interrupt the game of Laird and the Sheep Girl? When I say six o'clock, I mean six o'clock. And I slam the door. Y'all never came early uh -huh. again. Uh -huh. I often wondered what you told the people down below deck. I just right told there. Them, they ain't ready yet. They'll be down in a minute. <laughs> yeah. That did break you off from sucking eggs. Yeah. You know, uh, talk to you folks a minute. Let me run back here and yeah, get a go photograph ahead. so they'll see it, get an idea of what we look sure, like sure. at a formal party back then. Well, back in the day, you know, like I said, me and Grass have been friends 40 years. Yeah, I remember you as a kitten. I was just a wee kitten back in them days. He was the... He was the one that really refined me and helped me in so many ways. He took me under his wing. I already knew how to camp and stuff, but Grouch was the one that really showed me the proper way to do a lot of things and opened a lot of doors that I never would have seen had it not been for him. Uh, hunting, fishing, camping, just life experience, knowing how to do things. He was always the one that I could count on, that I could call up 2 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, I got a problem. And he was right there to listen. He'd give support whatever he needed to do, you know. And if I didn't think I could do it, he'd be there as quick as he could get there and he'd help me. And that was such a huge, huge advantage to me. And But having a, a kindred spirit that we could talk about common hunting, fishing, camping, the way we grew up, old southern living, Recipes even. Stuff like that. You just never knew what he was going to come up with at the next event. And what's this picture you got? Alright. I'm wearing the formal Scottish jacket, miniature muddles, and my Knight's Cross. And this will give them an idea of even in the woods when we dressed up for our formal night. Right. Or we went to a Scottish event because we wore uh, Scottish clothing mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit uh, in the buckskin and when we are doing the buckskin in there mm -hmm. of what we look like. Oh yeah. That's him and all of his finery. That's the miniature medals, Knight's Cross, French parachute wings, uh, U.S. Marine Corps diver's badge and parachute wings and then of course my her, yep. Right. Yeah. And he's so humble about it, I know. Yeah. Well, you know. It ain't bragging if you did. Well, it's, it's not that. Yeah. Is there was roughly between 30 and 40 of us in the Red Wolves. Mm -hmm. And every one of us did this. Mm -hmm. We sat up one night and uh, up here above Montgomery where we were in charge of security and what have you. Mm -hmm. And we had several thousand at that event. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were having our formal night. Later we put a couple of long tents together, laid out our tables, had the candles on them, mm -hmm. lanterns hanging out there. And we have had silver, mm -hmm. silver platters, mm -hmm. what have you. All the food cooked and laid out and chafing dishes and everything. Mm -hmm. We're all dressed in the nines. The women are dressed in their long formal gowns of the mm -hmm. 1700s. 
and we look out there and there's about three or four hundred people around us and some of them came and said can we take pictures yeah and I heard one wife say you see that that's what I want from now on I'm tired of you opening up a can of beans yes <laughs> Well, it had started out, the whole thing got going, because what it was, the Living History events, we're working for the whole week. If it ain't God's job, right. it was our job. And lecturing, teaching. Lecturing, teaching, whatever we needed to do. And one of the ladies, I think it was Miss Ann, had a real fancy dress she had just finished. Oh, yeah. And we had, I had made Hope's dress. For our wedding. Well, you know, I made uh, Leslie's we made wedding Leslie. dress. We, we sat there and sewed it, it yeah. on her. But mm -hmm. we'd made that dress up. And Miss Ann was complaining there was no place to wear that. Because there wasn't anything at these events mm -hmm. that you could wear. And so we decided to do a dinner. A fancy formal dinner. Mm -hmm. So the ladies could get dressed up in their finery. Well, that in turn meant that we had each of us get dressed up in finery and etc. And us cook all day. And us cook all day. Because the ladies didn't cook, we guys cooked. And so it got to be oh about four o'clock, the sun's gonna go down at six. About four o'clock we'd start putting everything in place. All the ladies are done up to their nines and everything. And we'd put out a big formal meal and everything else. And quite often me and my wife would play servers. We'd do the, the passing around the plates and everything else. And uh, everybody sat, and the, the people at this event, and there's about 8,000 people at this event, would be coming up and taking pictures of us because of our finery and the candelabras. And, and all of it 1700. Everything was 1700. There was nothing mm -hmm. there that wasn't in and proper Most finery. of it was hand sewn. Hand sewn or made or whatever. And there was goblets. There was proper cutlery, it was laid out in the formal things, and uh, they'd come up and take pictures. And so that's where it got going, and it got to be such a big to-do. Yeah. We finally had to pull the plug on it, because remember they were wanting to know if they, who was it? It was, uh, when we were at Huntsville for the Scotty game, there was somebody came there to talk to us, wanted to come film it. Remember? Oh, that's right, yeah. They wanted to yeah. film it. I remember that. Some sort of I also remember whatever. the Scottish games there at Huntsville were so hot and they had us in a football stadium. Yep, no wind. And no wind. And Ann and Hope's undergarments, uh, which were, you know, like dresses, were so filled with perspiration that they pulled off of them. Yeah, they just slid. They couldn't yeah. keep them tied up. They would not stay up. Because it's it was, wet. Oh, it was hot that day. Yeah, we cut that short like an hour ago, yeah, putting the ladies right. in, the, in the showers at the hotel room and cool them off because they were getting heat exhausted. Oh yeah, it was that was bad that day. Yeah. In fact, we left. We generally didn't leave till about four thirty in the afternoon. We pulled out of there at two. Yeah. We just couldn't, really, especially the ladies, because mm -hmm. back then cotton was more expensive than wool. Yes. You know? Linen was the cheap. Right. And uh, so all of this stuff was made of wool. And wool in the summertime in, a, in Alabama don't go. Oh, no. Wool whiskey. Remember Wally up there at Fort Toulouse? He wanted to wear the dang uniform they had up at uh, Fort Louisburg mm -hmm. in Alabama, which was a yeah. wool blend shirt, wool blend underwear, wool blend pants, wool blend vest, then a waistcoat, then the great coat, right. and then a big old felt hat. And 100 degree heat in Alabama? Yeah, he'd been dead an hour. Yeah, he just, it, he wanted Boy, to be he'd a have cooked tender. Yeah. Well, before I forget it, I'm going to show you something I just got. I was up at uh, the gathering here about a week ago. I'm impressed with it. And my good friends, uh, J.J. and Mike of Fuel the Fires, and my other good friend, William Collins, who's the big knife wizard, surprised me and gave me a copy of the knife that you've already seen in my videos, guys, of the gray man. And I want to bring it over and show it to Grouch. Let him get a look at it, because he appreciates knives like I do. Well, first thing I told you when I picked it up was I really like that grip. Mm -hmm. You can... uh. Your hand can be cold, you can have blood all over it, and uh, it reminds me 
of uh, some of the knives that we had made for fighting in that we had carved finger grooves because mm -hmm. blood is, is like oil, it is slicky. Mm -hmm. And the, when I pick this up and felt of it, I really like that grip. I like the thickness of that blade. Mm -hmm. That means that if there's a car on fire, you can stick this right through that wonder mm -hmm. and pry that wonder out and get somebody out. Yep. That means if you're upside down under a boat, you can cut your way out through that aluminum. I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, it's well made. I like the, I like the point, mm -hmm. the spear point. Mm -hmm. It's even on both sides, so it's not going to run one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's got the dull on the back, so you oh, yeah. can pop in and use it for skinning. That, that's right. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, when I was skin, I'm going to touch your blade now. you got to wipe it later. I will. Okay. I would hold a knife like that and go right down and skin. Yep. Right yeah. Right finger right on the back tip. of it so I could make sure I didn't cut through my hide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like it. That's a that's well made. Uh, since we're not out there playing kill somebody, I like the international orange so if you accidentally drop it and you walk through, you're not looking for something camouflaged. Yeah, it, it will shine one that's way or right. the other. That's right. I like that. Uh, all positive. Of course, my favorite knife of all times for all around use. Mm -hmm. I bought it in 1959. I carried it in a lot of different countries. I have used it for real on a variety of things, including man. Uh, is my British Kukri. Mm -hmm. That heavy blade, mm -hmm. it lets me have a short machete. It mm -hmm. lets me have a shovel. Mm -hmm. It lets me have a frying pan to cook off of. Mm -hmm. uh, it lets me have a weapon of war, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I've had other kukris. I've had really nice looking ones with mm -hmm. beautiful horn, a lot of brass and mm -hmm. all. But uh, I went through about four or five sheaves. And finally, about 20 years ago, I got a piece of seasoned hickory and carved out the sheaf because they're made mm -hmm. of wood. He carved it out, sanded it, glued it together, and then took Marine Corps mm -hmm. thousand mile an hour tape, which people out here would call triple thick duct tape mm -hmm. with a cloth backing, and wrapped around that sheath, and I've never had to replace it. I remember it. that. Well, the, the sheath, a good friend of mine up in uh, Ohio, Randy, at uh, Thank Stitch you. Gear. Thank you. Stitchgear.com, he makes these sheaths. Remember how I used to carry it, Ron? I carried my knife in Cheyenne yeah. style. You can run your belt through here or through that to do it Cheyenne. The guys that fuel the fire, they like to carry these knives underneath the shirt horizontal and sealed. So it doesn't attract a lot of attention that way. And it's got a regular belt loop. Now I'm the one that added these uh, wire lanterns because I've been clipping me a strap on it and putting it on like a uh, baldric initially. Yeah. Because you and I talked about that early on, when you got a sheath that's brand new and it's real tight, if you're having a stab to put it in, you're going to cut up the sheath until it kind of gets wore in. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be able to get it up here where I can see the mouth a lot easier to put it in and out. But uh, good leather. Well, yeah. I was always, you can't have too many knives. And uh, We and, both suffer from that affliction. Right, and when I went to war, and I did in a lot of different places, 23 different countries. Uh, I had a short boot knife. These knives are not necessarily to kill a person. Mm -hmm. They're to be able to get to when you need it. I had a friend of mine die. Mm -hmm. We were parachuting and he got hung in a tree on the back of his cartridge belt. Right. And every time he moved, he slid up and finally it forced the air out of his lungs and he died of asphyxiation because yeah. he could not get to a knife. Yeah, to cut and, himself free. That's right. And I had another one that died almost the same way except his was a static line under his throat mm -hmm. and he could not get to a knife. So I had a knife she sewn on the 
in my small of my back horizontal with a belt so I could reach back. Mm -hmm. I carried one up here on my harness, one in my boot, and then of course my two crew, mm -hmm. and uh, then a pocket knife. Right. And uh, but every one of them had their purpose. Uh, and I never used my boot knife except maybe to fix food or something. Never used my knife up here. Used my pocket knife a lot and used my kukri all the time. Oh. But if I needed it, it was there. I remember when you, because you had that Puma yeah. belt knife. You kept that thing. That was for deer hunting. That was for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, I got that in Africa. Uh, when I was over there playing, mm -hmm. uh, when I left, uh, the, the outfit that was our host supposed to feed or take care of us while we were doing some work there was a unit called the 37th Grays. Uh -huh. And they gave me that knife for what they said doing a good job. And that was my African knife. Mm -hmm. And it has that African bill to it and all. Right. And I carried and used that from then on. I was very proud of that. that Rated right up there with me as the bronze or silver star. I got you. Well, we were down at the cabin, down there at the water, and a squire was there, and I remember it. And we were down there at your camp, and you had that knife, and you had laid it down on that little tables like we used to make on the stools yeah. right beside mm -hmm. your to get up and go do something with a dog or whatever, and it come back, and squire had picked that thing up and was trying to split fat wood with it. Remember that? <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, you got in trouble. Oh, I could still hear all the oxygen being sucked out of the atmosphere at that moment. Yeah. Because he was sitting there trying to wedge down and crack and crack and crack and crack, and that was such a fine, polished edge. And <laughs> Oh, boy, we both, you know, I was at my tent probably 25, 30 yards away and didn't know what was going on. And all at once I hear this sound of, what are you doing? And I turned and looked. And he yeah. had a possum in the headlight. Oh yeah, <laughs> well he was using a piece of wood and what they don't realize, when you hammer on a blade, you change the molecules in that blade. Yeah, you can break it in. Oh yeah, you, and it'll break It'll break later when you need it the most. Yeah. I saw a machete do that one day and guy was, you know, swinging it, using a machete the way it was supposed to be, but they had split wood with it and that blade broke just as clean as if you'd have taken a hacksaw. Yeah, to pop. It. Just like that. It's gone. That and micro crack yeah. runs and yeah. it's like a piece of rubber breaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would never hammer on my, my kukri because of that. Yeah. Uh, if I couldn't split it the way I wanted, I just went and got myself made a wedge. You got another piece of wood and split it that way. Right, because once you get the first good cut started, you can put the wedge in there and just beat it. Right. Beat, make you a, a, a club and just beat the snot out of it and split it. Remember we were at uh, Unicoi and they had them big hunks of firewood. Yes. It was quarters. It wasn't split at all. It right. was that thick and that big around wanting us to bust them with tomahawks. And me and Captain over, um, I took my, uh, which would make them cry, my tomahawk, and I made a line Right. Going back and over and over until I got a good line going. And he's sitting over there whittling wedges and we went yeah. hammering in wedges and we went busting all that up. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, you know, a lot of wood, you know, and white oak, yeah, you can split. Because the brain is, is perfectly straight. That's what they make baskets and barrels yeah. and all of that out of. But uh, uh, there's a lot of this wood, you don't want to jump on that way that twisted grain, you know. You can even take a professional log splitter. You'll get to it. But when you get to, you got a piece of wood that's corkscrewed. Oh yeah. Black yeah. gum. Black gum. Black gum does not split. It may come apart, but then fibers just run like waves through it and you never get anything. You use you, the hydraulic press and right. bust it, but you, it is not split. It's just busted. Do you remember how to tell a black gum tree from another tree? Tell the audience. It is the only tree that when you see it growing, the limbs come out at a 90 degree angle. Yep, they don't go up, they, they go, go up, straight out flat. No warp, 
a 90 degree angle. If you're going to cut it, it don't make good firewood. And if you're going to try to split it with an axe, it's an effort and futility. But if a man wants to carry a cat home by the tail, I say let him. Because he's learning a lesson he wouldn't have known any other way. He has got a life lesson. That's right. You well, know, we've been at it. I, we have, and I think my battery's about to run out. So well, that's might... okay. Well, I've enjoyed being with you folks this time, and I'm glad that Blackie and I got to walk down memory lane because we don't do it enough. And I want to encourage you to build good memories so when you get, like me, old, you have a lot of good memories mm -hmm. to go canoeing with, to dream about, to share with others, and to encourage the young kittens coming along mm -hmm. to want to do it too. Exactly. Brother, thank you. All the way. Till next time, guys, I'm Blackie and the famous Crouch. Safe journeys, everybody.